You are tuning in to the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast on YouTube. This is Mind Pump. Okay, today's giveaway is awesome. So if you leave a comment underneath this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this podcast and we pick your comment, we say it's the best one. Doug says, I like this one the best. Here's what you get. You get a free container of Pulse pre-workout from Legion. This is my favorite pre-workout. The ingredients are legit. Of course, citrulline in there for the pump, beta alanine, caffeine to give you that energy, theanine to balance it all out, uh, alpha GPC. It's a great product. One of our favorites, bubblegum flavor. This is the mind pump version of Legion Pulse. It's bubblegum flavor. So leave a comment in the first 24 hours. If we pick it, you get this. Also subscribe to the channel uh, and turn on your notifications so you can be one of the first people to comment when we post these videos. Okay, today's podcast is with Arthur Brooks. He is a behavioral scientist, a professor at Harvard University. Uh, very, very smart man. We're going to talk about the science of happiness. This interview blew my mind several times. You'll actually hear me say that several times in this uh, interview. Also, before the podcast starts, let me remind you all, the phase two bundle still going on. This is MAPS Performance. This is our workout program that is athletic-minded. And MAPS Aesthetic, which is a bodybuilding-minded workout program. Both of them about three months long each. Normally at retail, will cost you about 300 bucks. But right now, you can get them both in the Phase 2 bundle for $79.99. So this is your workout videos. We tell you how many sets, how many reps, what exercises. Everything you need to follow the programs. One-time payment, $79.99. Go check them out. Go to MAPS February. Dot com. But other than that, enjoy this interview. Arthur, it's uh, it's great to have you on. You're one of my favorite people, um, well, favorite people in the world. You're just such a positive, uh, wise individual. You, you communicate so well. Um, but I really consider you to be one of my go-to people uh, on the subject of happiness, you know, um, an expert on happiness. Um, so Thank you, Sal. And by the way, before you continue, you've done so much for me too. I mean, I don't. Your guests probably don't know, but you know, you and I met. I met you long before you met me because I'm I'm a I'm a mind pump listener for years now, and you know, it's. It, I was wondering at some point how many of the Harvard faculty are mind pump listeners. I want, I'm I'm kind of wondering that, but I bet you there's more than just me. And you've been so helpful. I mean, your attitude about self improvement about how each of us is responsible for through personal responsibility, but more than anything else that we have this, this accomplishment mentality that you guys at mind pump are, are, are serving people. The reason it's the most popular fitness, health and, and entertainment podcast in the world, by the way, is not because just because you're giving great fitness tips, it's because you're helping people live better, happier lives. And me as a guy who does work as a scholar on, on happiness and on the side, trying to stay in really good shape because of you, you know, this is a, this is a natural synergy, I have to say, but you've done a lot more for me than, than I've ever been able to do for you. Oh, well, I really appreciate that. Um, so let's, let's talk about happiness. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, first off, how do we define it? You know, sometimes I'll read articles and studies and they'll say things like people in Denmark are the happiest in the world or people over here are happier than over there. Is it just simply asking people if they're happy? Or like, how do we define it? Is it is it the the good feeling of joy that I'll get if I, you know, you know, drink a nice bottle of, of wine or hang out with my kids? Like, how do we define it first off? So a lot of people, different, a lot of different scholars and, and and ordinary people define it in different ways. Happiness means everything and nothing. It's one of these contentless words. It gets people's attention because the one thing that we know is we all want it. The trouble is when you ask people to define it, most people, particularly Americans and people in the West will say, well, I feel good. They'll talk about their feelings. Mm. And that's actually not very helpful because feelings are really transitory. The way that we measure it in, in the social science business. So I'm a, I'm a behavioral social scientist. And the way that we measure it is we ask people to, to assess their own level of general well-being. And that mixes a whole bunch of stuff together I'll talk about. But basically, you'll say all things considered, <clears throat> life has got ups and downs. How happy would you say you are about your life? And they give you these incredibly stable and honest answers as long as they're answering anonymously. You don't ask that, you don't answer that in front of your wife. Mm. For example, you got to do that, you know, in a, you know, in, in the in the conscience of your own heart. But the way that people actually answer that question is that they're thinking about three different dimensions. And this is what the science has, has uncovered. They're thinking about, they're thinking about enjoyment 
of their life. They're thinking about satisfaction or fulfillment with their life. And they're thinking about purpose and meaning in their life, all kind of agglomerated together. So you kind of mush those three concepts together. And if you got all of one and none of the other, you won't feel very happy. So if you're all enjoyment and no purpose, let's call that, you know, college life. Mm. Then you're basically partying and drinking and hanging out and, you know, meeting girls and fantastic, right? But you won't actually call yourself happy according to the data. Or if you're all purpose and no enjoyment, it's kind of grim, you know, it's like American Gothic. It's just not that fun. So you got to have those three and satisfaction is in the middle. And if you've got this balance between the gets this golden mean between those three dimensions, you're going to say you're a happy person. Oh, very interesting. So, because uh, I have always, uh, that's what, what what confused me is that, you know, I, I, I thought of it as a feeling, a feeling of enjoyment, but that makes perfect that's sense. one dimension. So, it's how, one part. How do you, how, okay, let's talk about each one and the things that we can do or that you've seen in the studies and the work that you've done that help contribute to each of those. You said satisfaction, enjoyment, and then purpose and meaning. Yeah. 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 So the, the first one is enjoyment and enjoyment means actually trying to be fully present in your life. <clears throat> the main reason that people don't enjoy their lives, they can have something chronically wrong, like, you know, major depressive disorder or, you know, health problems, or one of the things that you talk about an awful lot on the show is the fact that people just aren't happy enough when they, when back in the old days, when you were actually coaching people, when you were, you had clients that you were training, they would come to you and they wouldn't be happy because they didn't feel good. And, you know, they're making these, these unforced errors about their life. They weren't enjoying their lives enough. So when people are, you know, morbidly obese or where they're suffering from diabetes or they're, they're, they're just too sedentary and have the comorbidities of sedentary behavior, then, then they're just not going to enjoy their life very much. So that's one of the things where you have particular expertise. So being fully present and ready to enjoy what life has to offer is number one. And so the one thing that I, you know, I talk about is we go through an inventory of, of, you know, their, of what's going on in your life. You know, what are the things that, that really the barriers from holding you back to full enjoyment of your life? The second is satisfaction. And satisfaction is really, really hard. There's this one concept that we talk about an awful lot in my business called the hedonic treadmill. Hedonic means feelings. Mm -hmm. And the hedon hedonic treadmill is, is basically the problem with satisfaction where you run and you run and you run and you run and you don't actually get any more satisfaction. So something good happens to you, you earn a bunch of money and the next day you feel like you were before, you buy a $2 million house and you're actually not happier. You get that car you've always wanted and as you're driving it off the lot, you're dreaming about the next, the, the, the better model. That's the, the, the treadmill. And the reason is because your brain processes your emotions in a way that don't let you uh, have very much satisfaction from worldly things. That's a process that's called homeostasis in which you always return to an equilibrium because your brain has to be ready for the next circumstance to keep you alive. Mm. You have to be ready all the time. And so if you're like elated because something happened to you for weeks and weeks and weeks, you would not be prepared for what was going to about to hit you next. And, and, you know, back in the old days, you'd probably, you know, I love that meal so much and you're beaming about it and you're not paying attention to saber tooth tiger eats you and you don't pass on your genes. So there's a re an evolutionary reason why this would be the case, but it's super frustrating because you can't get satisfaction. So that's the satisfaction problem. And the, the answer to that is, you know, this, by the way, Mick Jagger saying that song, I can't get the satisfaction. That's the biggest Rolling Stones hit ever. Not because it's a good song. because It isn't. It's because <laughs> it speaks to the human condition. It's like, oh yeah, man, Mick says I can't get a satisfaction and neither can I. Wow. So, so that's important. So the way, but there is a way to short circuit it. And the way to short circuit it is to remember that satisfaction is not a product of what you have. That's what we think. I'll be satisfied if all the stuff that I want, I have, right? Uh, the car, the job, the money, the success, the relationships, the fun, right? Satisfaction is actually what you have divided by what you want. It's your haves divided by your wants. Now, everybody remembers enough of their high school math that when you've got a fraction, you can lower the value by increasing the denominator. When the denominator gets bigger, the whole fraction falls. So your satisfaction falls when your wants go up. So one of the things that I counsel people on when I'm working with executives and I'm working with people is that I say, I say, you know, you feel dissatisfied, even though you're rich, how come? It's because you haven't been managing your wants and your, you know, that denominator has been sprawling like the suburbs of San Jose. It's just like, it's going freaking crazy and you haven't been paying attention to it. So what you need to do is get a reverse bucket list where you, you look at all that stuff in your, I mean, the bucket list is the dumbest idea for happiness ever. 
You should look in that bucket of all your wants that you've been worshiping and craving and desiring and just pull out a handful of wants and say, I'm going to get rid of this one and that one and that one. I'm going to detach myself. If I get that stuff, great. But these aren't my wants anymore to be free. The last one is purpose. And purpose is tricky because purpose, and this is the part of, of happiness that people don't usually understand. <clears throat> True happiness requires unhappiness. Why? Because purpose requires pain. To find meaning in your life, and there's, and, you know, pain is, is just incredibly sacred. If we miss out on pain, we miss out on post-traumatic growth, we miss out on experiences, we miss out on learning. And, and you and I have, in, in our personal lives, have talked about these experiences that have been painful for us, for you and for me. And, and, and you know, when we talk about the things that we know would make us the men that we are, it's never like, oh, I went to this party when I was 18, it was so awesome. You don't even remember that. You remember the bad thing that happened to you, the painful thing, the lesson that you had to learn, and that's where you actually get your, your purpose and meaning in life. So the key thing that I, I ask people to do if they don't have enough purpose is they need to be more fully alive and take more risk. They need to fail more. They need to learn more. They need to ask for, they need to ask for, for to say they're sorry. They need to make amends more. Uh, they need to be fully engaged in their life and stop. Usually if they, if you don't have purpose, it means you're running away from pain. Mm. I, this is why I love talking to you. Every time I, I talk to you, you end up blowing my mind. And I'm thinking of a few different things. You were talking about satisfaction. I thought that was so, so awesome uh, to talk about changing your wants. And it reminds me of the conversations I, you know, I've, I've had many times with my father. My dad is a he was a poor Sicilian immigrant. Okay, he was a, you know one of many children. They lived in a small you know concrete house. Uh, and he looks back on it and he talks about how uh, how happy he was, how he was so happy when he had an extra you know quarter to get some ice cream because he was so poor. That was such a big deal. Um, I think uh, you know to myself as I, I get more things and I want more, it's like this never ending well. So changing your wants, it's so absolutely brilliant, and I'd never even considered sitting down and, and taking those things down. Have you done that with yourself? Have you sat down oh, and said? Yeah. What are the yeah, what are some of the things you've had to, What are some of the things that you've had to remove that you wanted in the past that you've taken out? Well, there's a whole set of categories of things that that are chronic wants that 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 never bring satisfaction that always sprawl. So, for example, there you know the great philosopher and theologian Saint Thomas Aquinas, um, who wrote in 1265 this 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 tome, the Summa Theologica. That's one of the most important uh, books. In, in Western philosophy, as a matter of fact, it reintroduced Aristotle to the West, among other things. And the Summa Theologica, he talks about these four idols that everybody has. And it's incredible. It's like it was written yesterday. The four idols that we all worship, usually inadvertently, are money, power, pleasure, and fame. And fame for most people is not like, you know, you're famous because mind pump is such a big deal, but most people it's prestige, mm. like, you know, to be well regarded in your community. So money, power, pleasure, and prestige. And, you know, these, these are the four idols. Aquinas calls them the four substitutes for God, where, you know, like people really, really want God, but God's very inconvenient because a lot of one-sided conversations and misunderstandings and a lot of work and a lot of rules. And so like, now forget that. So I'm going to go for four things that, that have kind of a God-like appearance to them, money, power, pleasure, and fame. But they're all wants that never bring satisfaction. And so when I go through my, my reverse bucket list, I'm looking in there for the cravings that I have in money, power, pleasure, and fame. You know, what am I doing? Am I, am I, you know, going around the horn all the time, you know, looking for more dough? You know, and, and furthermore, I can, this is a good party game, by the way, is to, to ask people what their idol is and put them in reverse order. Mm. So, so I'll do it with you, Sal. So money, power, pleasure, and fame. Tell me the thing that least motivates you that you care the least about. Out of those four. Yeah, yeah. Because those are the four. Oh, fame. I mean, these are the idols in life. Oh, uh, fame has got to be the, uh, the 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 bottom one, and then probably you don't care. So you know, it's like it's people that sell the Stefano. It's like I don't know who's that. Some guy. No, I could care less. Salvatore the Stefano from Sicily. Right. <laughs> That's the, good job. Uh, the next <laughs> one might be uh, uh, what was the next uh, pleasure. You know, I, I enjoy feeling good, but yeah. um, uh, you know, I, I've I've done a good job, I think, of trying to kind of separate myself from that, so it's not super high on my list. Um, Money and power. I would say, you know, money might be next. Power might be next. I think mainly because both of those make me feel like I have more control over right. my life. So money and power give me more control over the things that I can do, I would say. 
Yeah. So knowing that is super important. Okay. That's incredibly important self-knowledge because then you can manage your reverse bucket um, by knowing that. Now, the key thing is 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 putting stuff into your basket that that you you should be going. So there's that's the bad four: money, power, pleasure, and mm-hmm. fame. And you know, a lot of people will feel kind of prideful because of the worldly rewards that they don't care about, mm. not paying attention to the fact that they're being completely controlled on some other dimension. I see this constantly. It's like, ah, oh, yeah. I don't care about money. It's like, great, but you're a freak for power. Right. Or, you know, you're like addicted to drugs because you're a pleasure guy. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's that's really important for, for people to keep in mind that, that you know, just because you're good on one dimension, is, you're probably falling down on another. The big four that you should have, you know, this is the second part of this exercise. And these are the things that truly enduringly bring happiness. So actually, let me back up from that a little bit. People will say, you know, what is the, what are the sources of happiness? So one thing is like, those are the ingredients, which is enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose. If I'm going to measure your number. So let me start by asking your number. So it's like, we always do it on a one to seven scale. It's called a Likert scale where one is complete misery and seven is total bliss. The happiest person you could possibly be. What's your, and, and I'm talking across sort of the cadence of your life in general. So looking at past the past couple of years, what's Sal Stefano's number? Uh, I'd say I'm probably close to a five. So I'm not a seven and I'm closer to the middle, maybe a little better than the middle. What would Jessica say about you? She would probably put me, she might put me at a six, maybe a little higher. She'd put your little six. Okay. Yeah. Now that's interesting because what that suggests that minor mismatch. Now you'd probably be surprised. She's probably closer to your number than you think yeah. if she were asked anonymously about you. But if she's a little bit higher, that means that she actually might be a better judge of your true happiness. Because sometimes people who are close to us are actually better at that than we are. Okay. Now, when I've got a whole sample of people across the population, and by the way, your partners at Mind Pump, you're a really good judge of their number too. Okay. Right. And mm-hmm. so and so if I got a whole sample across the population, I want to disaggregate the parts of that number. You know, what, what goes into that? I've got three, I've got three parts, three components that go into it. One is your genes, one is your circumstances, and another is your habits. So this is super important, right? I mean, a lot of people think that genes don't really matter, that it's all in, that it's all nature, nurture, not nature. But the truth is about 48% of your happiness is genetic. This is super important to keep in mind because if you had like, you know, if your dad was gloomy, you're going to have gloomy genes. That doesn't mean you're, that doesn't mean you get it all. I mean, some people look more like their parents some people look less like their parents, but you're going to have across the population more of a proclivity. You're going to kind of tend toward that half of your happiness coming from your parents. If you've got really bubbly, happy, ebullient parents, you know, lucky you, but you know, my parents were pretty dark, <laughs> right? And so, you know, my mother was an artist and my dad was a college professor and they lived in Seattle. It was gloomy <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so I got, I got gloomy genes. And the half of the other half or 25% is circumstantial. And that's what everybody's going for. That's what I think is really going to ratchet their happiness is that 25% because it's like, yeah, if I win the lottery, I'll be happier. If I get into a bad accident, I'll be unhappier, but that's completely wrong. Because circumstances are transitory. There's a study on paraplegics and lottery winners, and it turns out that six months after the big event, whether it's tragic or 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 you know victorious and happy, that people have returned basically to their old happiness levels wow. six months later. You're not a product of your happiness. Your happiness is produced inside your head, not outside your body. Wow, is the bottom line. And so never chase circumstances. That's the reason that money, power, pleasure, and fame don't give you satisfaction and put you on this treadmill of of frustration is that. So what's left is the 25. You can't control your genes. You shouldn't try to control your circumstances. It's it's your habits that really matter. And that's 25%. So so Sally, I'm going to give you your whole 25% under your control. And this is the big four. There are only four things in your happiness portfolio, uh, uh, faith, family, friends, and work. Mm. Those are the four. And so, and you got to put a, a deposit in each one of those accounts. So by faith, by the way, I don't mean a traditional religious faith necessarily. I mean, I recommend my Catholic faith to everybody who will listen, but the truth is I got the data and anything that gets you out of your head and brings you to 40,000 feet about the nature of existence. I mean, for example, you're super into you know, all different sorts of stuff. You named your son after the, you know, Marcus Aurelius, you know, the great stoic philosopher and emperor. 
studying stoicism. I mean, I had, I had Ryan holiday, the, you know, the guy who does the daily stoic on my podcast last week. And we were talking about, you know, we're just wonking out on the stoic philosophers and people who are super into stoicism, they get the faith bonus. But if you're only ever thinking about yourself and not about the bigger transcendental things, that's like involuntarily watching the same TV show over and over and over again until you want to die. Mm. So that's why faith family is self expression planetary friendship is super important and men always neglected and work is very simple work it doesn't matter what job you do whether you're a professional podcaster or professor at harvard university or whatever or driving a bus or you know you know laying bricks in sicily as long as you believe that you're earning your success and you're serving others then it will be meaningful and then you're going to get the gusto from it so the big mistake that people make is they're chasing money power pleasure and fame and what they should be doing is working on their happiness they're cultivating their diversified happiness portfolio, which is faith, family, friends, and meaningful work. Oh, that's that's very powerful. Uh, so I have a question uh, around this. Is uh, I notice? So I read an article. Scientific American put out an article. I think it was either this morning or yesterday, and it and the title of it was "Why Bronze Medalists." are happier than gold medalists. Yeah, that's uh, a great study. I love that study. Okay, so very fascinating. So essentially it's saying something like along the lines of, you know, the bronze medalist, it's essentially what you're comparing yourself to. I right. could have not gotten a medal, but I did, versus a silver medalist who's like, I could have got gold, but I only got silver. Yeah. What role does how we compare ourselves to others play in all of this? And I can't help but think of, in my space in fitness, the the, the social media space on how people are just – they can accomplish incredible accomplishments with their fitness and their physiques, but then they look at these pictures of other people and just these impar impossible comparisons, and they just end up feeling terrible. Yeah. So that's an old study of the Olympic medalists, and it shows that, that for example, the silver medalists die significantly earlier than both gold and bronze medalists. Wow. Gold and bronze medalists die about on average four years later than silver medalists do. And, and in the meantime, silver medalists are less happy. And the reason exactly as you suggest, the silver medalists go through the rest of their life saying it could have been me. Whereas bronze medalists are comparing themselves to the rest of the world that didn't win any medals. Mm. That's actually how it works. Now, you can be the recipient of, of positive social comparison, but as a general rule, Teddy Roosevelt President Theodore Roosevelt was right when he said that comparison, social comparison is the thief of joy. Mm. You know, if you want to ruin an experience, compare yourself to other people. It should be intrinsically satisfying if you're actually getting in shape and feeling good, but put yourself on Instagram. You can't win. You're, 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 you're going to lose because there's somebody else. I mean, this is, by the way, one of the reasons that the, the literature on social media is so alarming. I mean, we're finding out that increasingly social media is a public bad and brings people down in almost any dose. Anything, any amount of time over half an hour a day you're spending on social media, you literally get lonelier and more depressed. Wow. And it has everything to do with the fact that you're crowding out in-person relationships for happiness is love full stop. I mean, remember faith, family, and friends are all love categories. And if you do anything that's a substitute for love, you lose. Uh, everything you should do is anything you should do technologically should be a complement to your relationships, never a substitute for your relationships. And it's even worse. It's metastatically dangerous. If you're actually, if you're substituting for your human relationships and comparing yourself to everybody else's fake life, you know, Instagram influencers, especially in the, in the fitness space, they don't actually look like that. Mm. Are you kidding me? They look like that one day and they're so completely desiccated and miserable and food obsessed and you're know, yelling at everybody. And it's like, I finally got to my, you know, I'm finally, you know, 4.5% body fat, get the camera quick before I kill everybody. <laughs> you know, it's like, we all know what's going on. And you know, it's, I, I, a lot of what I know from this is because, you know, I'm a fan of yours. You know, one of the most inflecting things that you taught me when you were on my podcast, but also just because on your show, when you talked about the, the cosmic beauty of the dad bod, <laughs> You know, and it was really helpful for me, I have to say, because, you know, during coronavirus, there's everybody it doesn't matter, you know, if you study happiness or not, there's only four strategies for life in coronavirus, you know, and during lockdowns, which is like drunk, chunk, hunk or monk. <laughs> right. And, 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 right. And so, you know, I was like, I don't know, I'm going to get in the best shape of my life. And I was getting more and more and more and more miserable. And I heard you talking about, you know, that don't do that. That's crazy. Don't never, don't become food obsessed. Don't be stupid. But a lot of people will 
become unhappy because they're trying to be perfect and then and then put up this this facade of perfection and happiness on social media and in so doing they're lying and they're making everybody else miserable through social comparison so the one way that we can completely defend ourselves is to get off all of those sites and ration all of our social media consumption to 30 minutes a day or less with the rule that it's only to get information that we need and to communicate with people we love that, I, I think that's uh, excellent advice. You know, I have a uh, so I have a way of explaining it. I would love your opinion because this is your expertise. But I think uh, you know it's natural for us to kind of rank ourselves socially to see where we are. I mean, it's part of our evolution. And when you're on social media, you just turn your tribe into this much bigger tribe. But the people that tend to pop up on social media are anomalies. They just you know, for example, I read this statistic that. Uh, six pack abs are more rare than millionaires. I mean, I managed gyms for decades. And so this is already a, 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 a selection bias where you already have people who work out and nobody in there was super ripped in the gyms. It was actually quite rare in the gyms that I managed to see that. But when you're on social media, it looks like it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so then naturally you're just like, wow, I'm not only am I not in the middle, I'm so far, far down at the bottom. I, you know, I, I look terrible. Is that, am I explaining kind of what's happening? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly right. So you get people who are complete outliers or actually who, who depict themselves as outliers, because <clears throat> this is what you want. You know, it's like nobody puts on social media, you know, my kid just flunked math, brutal. You know, there, I was like, little Johnny is, is super outstanding yet again today. Or like, you know, my girlfriend screamed at me and told me I was a complete loser. I should get off the couch and go get a job. No, they're like out hiking today, beautiful in Northern <laughs> California. And, and so <clears throat> you want to look like an outlier on the positive side. You don't want to look like you have a normal life. That's the point of, of actually broadcasting yourself. That's the way that you actually climb the social hierarchies that are part of the human condition. The problem is that there's a lot of research that shows that we're incredibly bad at discerning that when we're looking at social media. Mm. We have a tendency to believe the things that people depict in the positive way and make a negative comparison of ourselves. This is a very normal thing to do. We're strivers is the bottom line. So you see somebody who's got six pack abs, you're like, yeah, every dude's got six pack abs. Well, you realize how hard it is to get six pack abs. I mean, it's like, you really know what it means to get to 8% body fat. Mm. That is, you're giving up a lot of life. It's really hard and it hurts, especially trust me, Sal, when you're 56 like me, it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and frankly, as you will often say, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. That's It's not worth it to, to feel good. It's not worth it to be healthy. It's not worth it to sacrifice your relationships. And, and by the way, you shouldn't be looking in the mirror that much anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so because it's natural for us to compare, I, th I think this is kind of part of, uh, you know, being a human. Uh, what would be, I guess, a fair person to compare yourself with? Would it be just yourself, I guess, who you were yesterday? Well, the pursuit of excellence means continuous improvement. I mean, that's really what we're talking about. And, that, and it's improving to uh, across your own set of goals toward uh, and, and, making a, a, and making progress in a positive way. Mm. The key thing that I often talk about is not, con is not confusing goals that will impress others with those that will bring you to higher levels of moral perfection. Mm. And so this is, you know, I, I've, I've written about this and there's a very tenuous link between fitness and happiness. And it's a very, there's a very interesting set of papers. I mean, I'm very, very big into fitness, as you know, I mean, I really, I really believe in it. The problem is that if you do it because you think when you get more beautiful, that you'll be happier, you're sadly mistaken on the cost and benefits. So you find, for example, that if you move from about the 50th percentile in beauty, that's right in the middle of the population. You're neither ugly nor beautiful. And you move to that 85th percentile, which is like, you got it going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're, you're more beautiful than 85% of the population, right? That will move you from the 50th to the 51st percentile in happiness. <laughs> It's just totally not worth it because, you know, you got to have surgery for that. You got to spend three hours a day in the gym for that. You got to, you know, you need a, like a divinely inspired miracle for that. In many cases, it's just not worth it. You need to do these things for intrinsic reasons. I want to challenge myself. I owe it to my family to become healthier and to, to, to live longer, to be able to, you know, dandle my granddaughter on my knee. That's what I want. Cause you remember faith, family, friends, and work, baby, that, that's what actually is going to make you happier. And so these goals that we have should be personal improvement goals toward those more cosmic goals that we have. And, and then, then, then these things are worth doing. 
Yeah, you're. I, I'll echo that. I mean, as a tr- I trained people for years and years and years, and I would always get the I want to lose weight so I can be happy, and I would have to eventually I'd have to work with them and train them and show them well, you got to be happy before you lose the yeah. weight because it's never gonna it's never gonna work out. You know, earlier you were talking about you know enjoyment, satisfaction, and uh, purpose. Enjoyment is about feeling good. Purpose is about pain. It almost it's like they're they're contradicting. How do we how do we reconcile that? Yeah. So the, the key thing is balance and, and everything in life is balance. It's balance between the time you spend in the gym and the time you don't spend in the gym. It's balance between, you know, the days that you, you know, you eat free and the days that you're on a diet. This kind of moderation is a, is a matter of prudential judgment. The happiest people actually find this balance in their life. The, the unhappiest people, the, the people who suffer from addiction, for example, they, they, they really have a hard time with balance. It's like, if that feels good, a little, then a lot is going to feel great. Mm. And that's wrong in almost every case. Mm-hmm. You know, you can get into these addictive behaviors. And, and by the way, there's there's brain chemistry that aids and abets this mistake. There's a neurotransmitter, neuromodulator called dopamine. And everybody at this point knows what dopamine is. It's implicated in all addictive substances and processes. So you can get addicted to, and I, I know a ton of people in my world who are addicted to success. People are addicted to work. They're workaholics, but also people who get addicted to drugs and alcohol and gambling and you know pornography and bad stuff. They, the reason is because your brain, your dopamine signals, they say like, I like that. Give me more. I want more right now. And, and then you start responding to your brain. Your, your brain chemistry starts pulling you and, and, and you need to retrain your brain. And the way that you do that is you become a master and the master is one who actually finds the balance. So that's the key everything in balance. If I'm basically looking for pure enjoyment, I'm not going to be happy. If I'm so stoic that I'm willing to put up with any amount of pain, then I don't have the balance either. Mm, I see. You know, you're a, a fitness fanatic so you, and you work out all the time. So you feel the physical pain of squats yeah. or barbell rows or deadlifts. Have you changed your relationship with pain uh, to make it something that you then can I mean, it's not enjoyable, the sensation, but rather you have a different relationship to it. Is that part of the key? Because I, I, I'm using fitness because I notice I do that with fitness, but with other things, I have, a, I have a tough time with it. Yeah, for sure. You know, when you actually see, when you start to associate the, you know, the progress toward your goals and, and ultimately the person that you want to be with the pain itself, then the pain becomes not just more bearable, but it, it becomes more sanctified. Mm. You know, it's interesting that, um, you know, we do this all the time and that, you know, the ancient, the monks during the middle ages, you know, we laugh at them because they were doing things like, you know, using a cord, you know, cords and whipping themselves or wearing hair shirts or something like that. And yet, you know, we're working out, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it's the, and the whole point was they were looking for spiritual perfection through mortification. I see. And, and there's a form of mortification that we're actually getting. And, and I love it. I mean, I just, you know, I jump out of bed every morning and I have a gym in my basement and I just love it. It's not because squats feel good. Squats are going to feel bad every day for the rest of my life. You remember Jack LaLanne? Of course. Remember that guy? Absolutely. He was, he was the, you know, he was the fitness guru when I was a kid. My mom had his records, you know, she put on a record. It's like, music and leg lifts and the whole thing in the living room. And she was, cause my mom was sort of in like in shape before being in shape was cool. And, uh, and Jack LaLanne, you know, I, I, I started following him a little bit when he was old, he died when he was in his late nineties cause he was so healthy. And on his 90th birthday, you know, he pulled a tugboat in his teeth across San Francisco mm-hmm. Bay or some crazy thing, you know? And he said, you know, he had these funny sayings. He would say, for example, if it tastes good, spit it out. <laughs> 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 and he would, uh, and, and he said that, he, 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 he hated every minute of every workout his whole life. And he wasn't a masochist. Mm. The point was you hate the pain, but you don't, you have a relationship with something that actually mortifies you for your own positive good. So it's, yeah, you know, it's like, you know, they got this guy, I mean, tomorrow is Saturday and you know, you got me doing full body workouts as opposed to, you know, it's like funny for the, for our listeners, I was, I met you in person when I was 55 and I was still doing a, like a stupid bro split and wondering why my back hurt. Yeah. 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 It's like, yeah. Get a clue, man. It's like Dr. PhD. Can't even figure that one out. You're like, dude, you got to go to full body three times a week. And so anyway, so tomorrow I'm going to start off and it's going to be like five o'clock in the morning and I'm going to be down there. You know what it feels like you do five o'clock in the morning doing squats, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's good. It's good because it's good for me and it's kind of good for my soul in a way. And, and all of these things that we do, you know, all the sacrifices that we make, the most sanctified kind of suffering, by the way, 
And I've got my column in the Atlantic is coming out, you know, the day after Lent starts mm-hmm. in February this year. It's a couple of weeks from now. The reason that sacrifice for other people is so pleasurable is because this sanctification, because of the sacredness that actually comes. And so you find, for example, that when you sacrifice, you sacrifice for your baby son. And it's, it's, it's good. You know, it's good. It's like you don't want to wake up at three o'clock in the morning. But when you do and it's dark and you're tired and your son's and you're giving him a bottle and he's sitting in your lap and you're like, thank you, Lord. This is a beautiful thank you for making it possible for me to do this for my son. And, and, and that's the way to live. That's the way to live. I'm doing it for people that I love. I'm doing it for reasons that matter. And then pain is different. Uh, yeah, that's uh, again, that's great. So, okay, so we're looking. I, I read these polls and these statistics, and it seems like people are more anxious, uh, more you know, of course, polarized. We hear that all the time. People seem to be more unhappy um, materially. Um, up until recently, people were doing better. In America, um, so we had more stuff, we had more money, we had less crime, but people are not as happy. And you know, from your perspective, what do you think is causing this? Of all those things you've talked about, what do you think is the reason why people seem to be less happy today than they were twenty years ago or thirty years ago? Yeah, so it's true. And so I've got data on the percentage of people that say that they're thriving. And I can look at it. I, I don't look at it during the coronavirus epidemic because you know you get these radical dips in happiness, sure. given the fact that people are living under un, un, unusual circumstances. So that's an outlier. So don't even don't even put that in. But if you look at just you know from right before the financial crisis until you know a, a year or two ago, you'll find a secular decline in the percentage of people that say that they're thriving, which is a good way. Gallup does this to measure how happy people are. And at the same time, every income group has been increasing in purchasing power which is the way you want to look at it. And people want to cook the data. A lot of people out there that want to say the rich are getting rich and the poor are getting poor. It's a lie. Mm. It's a, it's completely not true. And so you look at purchasing power and it's been it's radically increasing. So for example, the, the a person at the 10th per income percentile in America today has the same living space as a person at the 50th percentile in 1980. Mm. I mean, you were alive in 1980. It wasn't that long ago. And, and so that's the 50th percentile has gone to the 10th percentile. And that's, that's in living space, not to mention all the conveniences of life. And, you know, the, the, there are very, very few calorie deficits and just all this stuff about life. And yet thriving has been decreasing. So the key thing to look at and, the, you know, the diagnostic mechanism is to look at the portfolio of happiness and what's going on. Faith, family, friends, and work. We have all kinds of, you know, we, we, we basically we have made it harder. There, you know, the number of people who say that they have no religion at all has gone from you know, about 6% to 36% uh, since the 1970s. Uh, and again, you know, maybe they're substituting Stoic philosophy for it or you know, something that, that is a good substitute. But for a lot of people, what you find is there's this ennui, there's this, there's this kind of sense of emptiness that when you talk to people that they have because they don't have this, this transcendental sense, whether it's prayer, meditation, or philosophy, there's just less of that for young people. That's number one. Family. More and more people are estranged from their families. Today, 44% of people are completely estranged from a family member, 17% from a direct family member, which means a sister or brother, a child or a parent. I mean, literally not talking, 17%. One in six Americans has stopped talking to a family member because of politics. So wow. it's insanity. So that's a big source of unhappiness. Uh, uh, friendship, you find that we have this epidemic of loneliness. I just have my podcast, a woman named Norena Hertz, who's got this you know, this new book out, it's a big bestseller all across Europe and coming to the States now. And she talks about the data that show that, that people are lonelier than they've ever been. I mean, and, and there's a bunch of reasons for it. She sort of thinks that, you know, the government should be building more parks or something. But now, you know, I, I think that, you know, social media is fueling a lot of our loneliness. I think there's a whole bunch of, you know, interpersonal reasons that modern life is doing this and then work. You know, people are not thinking about their work in the right way. They're not thinking vocationally about serving other people and work. And so when these all these dimensions are going the wrong direction, you're actually going to see prosperity increasing and happiness declining. Mm. Do you think this is connected to materialism? Uh, because I know, I mean, obviously in this country, um, in, in many, um, you know, de- de- democratic free countries, we have this this great markets that produce what we want. We can get more and more of it. And of course, it's it's look, it's part of sales and marketing to tell you, you need this product, you need this thing, it's going to make you happy. We've been told this now for decades. And so do you think it's part of materialism where we're just 
so obsessed with more stuff because that's what we think is going to do it. And so we're forgetting everything else. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's again, it goes back to Aquinas, money, power, pleasure, fame. Mm. It's basically instead of faith, family, friends, and work, it's money, power, pleasure, fame. You know, people are looking for the easy fix and going for the idols. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that we're really due for a big spiritual renewal in this country. And it happens. I mean, we go through these cycles. There's nothing new under the sun. You know, people say that we're in secular decline. America's got its worst years, you know, ahead, its best years behind us. I don't believe it because I've actually seen these cycles where people go into kind of a spiritual funk where they, you know, their happiness, their thriving declines, they're, they're at each other's throats. You get a lot of this like crazy political populism from both sides uh, where, where we're encouraged by leaders to hate each other and be afraid of each other. And then you get this backlash where people are like, no, I refuse to be unhappy. And that's when you get people who get more interested in religion. People get more when they start falling in love more. I mean, Sal, consider this. People who are in their 20s today are a third less likely to be in love than people were when I was that age. I mean, you basically have people that are they're they're shutting themselves off from the the most important single source of human happiness, which is long term romantic love. I don't have to, con- to I have to tell you you're a happily married man and and me for thirty years and and the idea that I would be in my twenties and not dating and not in the market and not trying to lock down is just it's really really unthinkable. But that's kind of what we've got going on. Our values are ready for a, for a complete disruption. And we need spiritual, we need happiness entrepreneurs. And, you know, that's what you are, by the way. The nice thing about it is, you know, people come, they, they, they I, I, you know, I've talked to people who listen to Mind Pump. They, why did I go to Mind Pump? Because I wanted to be, I wanted my fitness routines to get better. And you guys had a really good reputation. And I stayed with it because I felt happier when I was listening to you guys, you know, and you were talking about, you know, just the, you know, the banter for the first 45 minutes of the show is like, yeah, I tried this thing. And it's like, oh, what about, did you see that movie? Actually, it was weird. You know, the craziest thing was I was listening to Mind Pump in the gym back in the old days when we could all go to the gym before I met you, about three months before I met you, four months before I met you for the first time. And you were talking about my movie. <laughs> it was the craziest thing. That really made me happy. But you're a happiness entrepreneur. I mean, you're a guy who's going in through the back door of, of fitness to under, help people understand that they can have a better, more fulfilling life. And that's why the first 45 minutes are stuff like, you know, mm. transcendental things and family. And you're talking about your friends and, and it's, it's good. There's a reason it works. Awesome. Thank you. You know, um, great. By the way, uh, the pursuit, great movie. I think everybody should watch it. I think it's uh, absolutely phenomenal. You know, I know that growth comes from uh, being uncomfortable um, yeah. or from pain I wonder if it's a blessing that we're all getting what we think we want. Like we're going to get everything that we think we want. And then we're going to realize this is, this is not giving me what I want. And and maybe that's what it's going to take to do what you're talking about. Get this kind of this upheaval, the spiritual transformation. So Mm. maybe we're heading there. You know, I think so. And, you know, this is also a a a key thing for parents. You know, there are a lot of people listening to us who have kids or who are going to have kids. I hope, I hope we all have tons of kids. And, you know, it's, I mean, I, my time has passed. I hope I have lots of grandkids mm-hmm. at some point, not too soon. <laughs> and, you know, but you know, this is the thing that parents do wrong is they try to shield their kids from a discomfort and pain. And we've gotten so good at it because we've gotten so rich that our kids are, it's, it's like they're, you're getting the measles because they're not getting their, their vaccine at this point. They're, you know, one of the things that's really interesting, you find that the parents helicopter parent their kids and give them everything they need and drive them around. And little Johnny's got to go to soccer practice. And he got into a tiff with some kid and it's like, I'm going to call a coach. And it's really, really bad because they get to college and then the kids demand, you know, you know, safe spaces and, and, and they, they protest and do cancel culture is because of fear. Like there's only two modes of culture. It's love and fear. And if you're, if it's not a love-based polarity, you're going to get a fear-based polarity, which is all over college campuses. And so they go through and then the colleges protect them. And then guess what? They get out in their twenties and they're ill-prepared for any sort of conflict, any sort of pain, any sort of rejection. And they're walking around really, really fearful and they're getting lonely. You know, that's, that's like, yeah, there's this guy named John Haidt, Jonathan Haidt. He teaches, he's a psychologist, teaches at NYU, visionary guy. And he's talking about how everybody's afraid this this you know epidemic of fear among people in the twenties. And he's, I said, who who's responsible for that? He's like, you are. I'm like, what are you talking about? I am what I do. And he said, well, 
He says, how old were you the first time that you went out on your own, like for running an errand for your mom all alone? I'm like, I don't know, five. <laughs> he says, how old was your daughter? I was like, I don't know, 14. He said, that's it. He said, you have not, you're not exposing your kid. That really, really changed my perspective. And, and, you know, I, I, it changed my parenting a little bit, I have to say. And the result has been really, really good because I'm, you know, I'm willing to, you know, my daughter, I'm not going to, I'm not going to check in every second. My son, you know, I, I've, you know, I've told you about my son, Carlos, he, you know, he said, dad, I'm not going to go to college. And I didn't fight him. I said, make your business plan. I'm your venture capitalist, make your business plan. He became a farmer. And now he's, now he's like, you know, shooting bad guys. He's in the, he's in the Marine Corps mm. and, you know, forward deployed uh, member of the infantry. He's protecting America. That, that I'm proud of because he built his life. <laughs> mm. That's excellent. Yeah. That's tough too, as a parent, because you just want to shield your kid uh, as much as possible. I have challenges with that myself all the time. That's something I'm oh, constantly, sure. constantly battling with. You know, the thing that drove me so hard to learn so much about fitness actually came from a, a, a dark place. I was very insecure about my body. I've talked about this on the podcast as a kid, as a 14 year old. Were you driven by something darker as well to, to become this expert on happiness? I mean, you, you know so much about it. You study it so, uh, so much. You're so good at communicating it. Did you, have, did you struggle with it with yourself? Is that what made you so, so interested in learning about it? Yeah, my happiness levels are low. I, I'm not, a, I'm not, I mean, it's, and, and, and again, I mean, I, I have gloomy parents. I had gloomy parents. They died young. Um, and my circumstances have been really, really good, but my baseline is not very good, mm. you know, and, and, you know, you don't study air when you've got a lot of it. Mm -hmm. It's funny, you know, you know, really well that people become super interested in something that's scarce. So, and one of the reasons that, you know, you've talked about this in the show and I've talked about this, I've taught this concept, the reason that 95% of diets fail, which is to say people gain back all the weight and then some after a year is because when you, when it's scarce and you become food obsessed, you do weird stuff. Mm. You think about it all the time. You would never eat a whole cake <laughs> under un ordinary circumstances, but you would when you're starving. Right. right. And so when somebody is really, really missing something, I mean, you were, you were, had a really bad body image. You were a skinny kid and you felt bad about it and all that. You were thinking about it an awful lot and you remediated it. And, 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 and I'm going to guess, I'm going to go out on a limb that you didn't remediate it always in a healthy way. Right. You know, you went too far and then you actually had to dial back and now you're in a really, really uh, healthy space. For happiness, for me, it was just elusive. You know, my wife, um, I'm married for a super long time and <clears throat> on a one to seven scale, she's like a 6.8. Mm. And, and, and she would never study happiness because that's a, why would you study air? There's lots of air out there. What a weird thing to study. It's like, you know, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. So that's the main reason um, that I really got into it. The other thing is that, you know, I, early on, I, I, this is a complete like fourth career for me. I started out, I was, um, I was a professional classical musician um, from the time I got kicked out of college when I was 19 uh, for dropping all my required classes and goofing off and, you know, taking Indonesian dance and, you know, North Indian drumming and all those things. <laughs> anyway, therein lies another dubious tale of my past. And, and I spent my entire twenties traveling as a professional classical musician. That's super, super taxing. That's many hours a day. It's like a, it's like, you know, bodybuilding. Mm. It's, it never stops. It's completely relentless. It's totally self-driven. It's all about, you know, the validation that comes from excellence all the time. And so I kind of got into this groove of when you do something, you do it all in super effectively as much as you possibly can. So then I went, you know, when I was, I went to college when I was 30 and then I got my PhD and became an academic and, and I treated my academic work the same way that I treated classical music, which is just, you, you get gas pedal all the way down. And that made it possible to do something like this. I thought, okay, what do I need? Happiness. How am I going to do it? Like a classical musician, boom. <laughs> mm, mm, great. That's great. Uh, so, so those four things you talked about, which were family, friends, uh, work, what was the fourth one again? Faith. 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 There you go. Yeah. So those four things, how would somebody, let's say somebody's listening right now. Um, cause I like to give people takeaways, right? And let's yeah. say somebody's listening and they're like, you know what? I want to, I want to construct a, for lack of a better term, a routine. I want right. to be able to put those things together so that I can control the 25%, I think you said of, of my happiness through habits, through those four things, what would that look like in a day or a week? So the key thing is to do a, a serious inventory, you know, a, a self-examination 
um, you know, whenever it's convenient. I would say, you know, some sunny, Sunday afternoon, we've got a little bit of time <clears throat> and say, okay, where am I on these? Where am I realistically on these dimensions? Most likely you have goals that, you're, that are unmet in these dimensions. Most people are like, yeah, I really want to have a better relationship with my parents. And, you know, I really should call my mom more. Or, you know, why don't I have any friends? Or, you know, I've always wanted to read more wisdom literature. All the, those are basically goals in the faith family and, you know, friends categories. Uh, most people are not who are listening to you because people who are listening to you are excellent. I mean, they're people who are achievers. That's because you have a culture of high achievement and high effectiveness. So most people who are listening to us right now are, um, uh, you know, they're, they're already good on the work dimension. <laughs> And this is interesting because a diversified portfolio is every bit as important as, you know, getting the parts right. Mm. I mean, diversification, only paying attention to work is like putting your entire pension into Greek bonds. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, oh, you're right. I mean, you can do it, but I don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it might work out, but probably not. So what I recommend is like just really doing a serious inventory of this and saying, where do I need to make, uh, where do I need to make gains? Where do I need to make progress? And then at the end of the day, do a little examination of conscience at the end of each day and say, did I put a deposit into each one of these accounts or did I not? And, and if you didn't, you got to make a, a resolution that you're going to do it tomorrow. Because it, either you did or you didn't, right? I mean, it's not like, oh, I forgot to go to work today. No, you didn't. Right. You didn't forget to go to work today. You got up and because it was part of a routine. And the same thing is true with respect to your faith and your family and, and your friends. And so what I recommend is that you actually put it into your schedule. So, you know, every day, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I set, I like, I like pen and paper because it's visceral and I put my thing together and I have time for prayer. You know, I start off, I go to mass with my wife every morning and then we come back and we eat breakfast together. We're, you know, cultivating our marriage mm. and our faith. And I make sure that I call family members and I have time, you know, in my day, it'll say when I'm going to call one of my friends. And, and I remember people that I'm actually going to talk to because, you know, this is serious business. Your happiness portfolio is a serious business. At the end of the day, I'll say, mm, I fell down on the friends category and make that call. I'm not going to do that tomorrow. So do the four buckets and put something into each one of the buckets and each Sunday assess the extent to which you're, you're going toward your happiness goal. And if you do that, boy, oh boy, you're going to feel, you're going to feel better. That is, that is a very powerful takeaway. I'm, I'm actually going to implement that. I appreciate that. Um, okay, honest opinion, looking at the state of things uh, and the way things are right now, and a lot of people would say they're kind of gloomy, do you think uh, we're going to change? Do you think we're going to improve? Do you think it's going to get better before it gets worse? Or, or worse mm. before it gets better, I should say. I think it's, well, I mean, it, that's what we in my business call the stochastic process, which is like a random walk. You can't say if it's going to get better or worse, but one thing you can say is not going to stay the same. Okay. And and I do believe strongly that that before too long we will see significant improvement. And and the reason is because things that can't stay the way they are won't. You know, people don't like it. Ninety three percent of Americans hate how divided we become as a country. Mm. And when you see that, that's a huge entrepreneurial opportunity. I mean, that's like, you know, people walking around going, I can't believe there's no restaurants in this town. That's a huge opportunity. You know, open a restaurant, man. You'll make a boatload of money. And so po politicians, I was just talking to a big group of politicians in Washington today, as a matter of fact. And I said, look, guys, you want to get rich and famous. Now's your, op your opening. People are sick of what's going on in this country. It doesn't matter if you're a conservative or a liberal or you voted for Biden or Trump. You don't like it. And furthermore, you love somebody who disagrees with you politically and you're tired of having people on your own side trashing the people that you love. Mm. That's a big opportunity. So I think that the bitterness that we see in our country, the polarization is, is actually people are going to jump on that and we're going to see kind of a populism of virtue coming along. That's traditionally what's happened too. as, a, as an historical matter. We've been like this a bunch of times. It's not it's, it's been worse than this. And we've seen dips in the amount of uh, of our ability as a country to actually get along and love each other. And that's when people pick up the ball. So we're due for something like that. When it comes to the happiness revolution, I think that we're actually due for some spiritual entrepreneurship where people are going to be, and, and I don't just mean religious, where people are going to be thinking about uh, matters of the soul, a love revolution is going to come along. My parents were super freaked out because in the late 60s, early 70s, I was a really little kid. I barely remember this, but they're like, ah, oh, these filthy hippies, you know, they're having sex all over the place and they don't understand the nature of love. And 
And it's like, okay, now it's exactly the opposite problem. <laughs> you know, you know you're, it's everybody's grim and nobody loves each other. And, you know, I, I realized that, you know, the, the Woodstock was a, was a nightmare, but give me Woodstock over an unhappy college campus any day. Yeah. And so I think that there's going to be, you know, that tendency coming as well. And these are welcome things. I mean, we have to we have to, you know, hit the brakes on ourselves so that we don't fall, you know, prey to our appetites. But, but man, I think that a spiritual revolution, a love revolution, uh, a revolution in which the polarity goes from fear to love in our politics, you know, I think that sooner or later we are going to see these things. And, you know, I just hope I can be part of making it happen. That's great. That makes me feel good. Uh, You talk to a lot of uh, very influential, powerful people. You talk about politicians. I know you, you know, have lunch with uh, ex-presidents and senators and uh, when you talk to them about this stuff, are they receptive? Are they receptive to hearing, uh, you know, what you have to say about happiness and helping other people become happy? Yeah, they are. And and part of the reason is, well, part of it is the people I have lunch with are generally the, you know, the, the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's also their people, you know, their people too. Now that they, they might lack ambition to do the right thing and they might, and, and they face a ton of risks too. I mean, you can basically say, stop being a hater. They say, if I'm not a hater, I'm going to get, you know, primaried and voted out of office. That's true. And there's these, you know, these political realities that they face, but you know, you got to say at some point, what are you willing to go down for, man? I mean, you know, you're willing to, to say things that you don't believe and they don't, they, they, they're eager for this progress as much as you and I are actually, you know, this, it was funny, you know, when I moved to Washington, cause I was the, the president of a think tank in DC, a really big think tank in DC for 11 years. And when I first got to Washington, I was very cynical about politicians. I was like, ah, you know, p- political pros, they'll say anything. They're really shallow. And that's actually, I was wrong. I was really impressed at the quality of the people and the dedication to service and how much they suffer when people attack them. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm less cynical than, than most of the people that I know, but that doesn't mean they're perfect and they can actually use coaching. And, and you know what else? They need friends. You know, I've gotten, I got, a, I got a text from a senator while you and I were taping this. He's my friend mm. and I like him and he's a good person. And there's going to be, you know, I think, if I do my job and you do your job and, and if they, they do better, if they all listen to mind pump, by the way, that we can all make a better world, but we have to nudge our friends um, to do the right thing. Arthur, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. You make me feel good every time I talk to you. And you know, I, I encourage everybody, listen to this guy's podcast, find anything he has on YouTube because you do, you just feel good and empowered uh, after watching you. So I, I appreciate, I really appreciate your friendship and I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it a lot. Um, I think of you and, you know, we text pretty regularly, but you've helped me so much and you're helping so many people around the world. Nothing gives me greater satisfaction than the fact that Mind Pump is going from strength to strength. Ah, So thank you. Thank you again. Now, is that, you know, a valid question for a potential client to ask, you know, the trainer, like how many people are you servicing? 100%. 100%. I think it should be how many clients do you work with? How closely do you work with your clients? Like, right. If you're a client and you're asking a potential trainer, like think of all the scenarios where you've been disappointed before. By the way, if you're a coach, think about on your come up, 